I'll introduce Laura O'Connor to you, ENT Registrar, Royal Darwin Hospital, um, and Laura is going to talk to us around tele teleotology. That's it. A picture tells a thousand words. Thank you. Very Please much. welcome Laura. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I want to thank the speakers that spoke before me. It's excellent and very informative. Um, and just on that note, I'd, I'd like to recognise that we talk about telehealth and tele oh, for us teleotology, but um, these services for patient care. But I think it also it's you can't underappreciate as a doctor or as a, a clinician or a, any kind of health um, service person what good support this is when you're in local communities. So. I remember I did my intern and residency in Proserpine in, um, yeah, and you know, as a junior doctor with no experience, you're um, on after hours on your own in the hospital. So to have a service like this would be a fantastic support where you can dial in someone more senior to get advice when you feel out of depth. So anyway, back to my talk. So my talk's on teleotology. So that's, um, it's a little bit different from the average telehealth service in, fa in the fact that it's actually a person-to-person, face-to-face traditional consultation. And our digital data that we get from that is then sent on to the um, ENT department in Darwin for opinion and management. So I'll talk to you a little about, a bit about the area and the population we service and why we have a need for a telehealth service in ENT what exactly our teleotology entails and the impacts, benefits that we've been able to show to date and the challenges that we face. So this was already touched on about the area that um, we service, but we cover the top end of the Northern Territory. Um, we service a population of around 200,000 people and 30% of those are Indigenous Australians and that compares to a national average of, of 3% um, and 80% do live in isolated areas. Our, we're right up there in the top in Darwin and our ENT service um, at the furthest clinic that we run is La Jumanu down here which is about 900 kilometres away. So that's, that's a distance greater than from Hobart to Melbourne in terms of getting to that area. So a background about why in ear and he hearing health, why we, there's such an important need in the Northern Territory for um, telehealth services. So. It was first identified, well it's always been talked about, but it was really first identified statistically, the need um, for improvement in Indigenous children's hearing health. So in, in 2007, the Child Health Initiative Check that was run as part of the Northern Territory Emergency Response identified that of the 9,000, about a bit over 9,000 children that they did the child health check on, which is a generalised health check, 30% of these had um, middle ear disease and hearing impairment. So from this early data, um, the ENT department in Darwin developed an outreach service. So that's where we, as the clinicians and with our nurses and audiologists, would go out to the communities. And we still run those programs. We still have that. We still have remote operating trips as well. Um, but from that data that we were ab able to gain in the early years, between 2007 and 2012, we found that 77% of the children that we were seeing under the age of five had middle ear disease. Thank you. <laughs> um, just sing out if you can't hear me down the back. And more worryingly, 10% of children under the age of five actually had an eardrum perforation from chronic recurrent infections and 50% had hearing loss, uh, significant hearing loss in at least one ear. So why do children of Indigenous background have such significant ear disease? We've actually, I recently gave a talk at a conference overseas that was looking at um, developing countries and trying to eliminate middle ear disease and hearing loss in developing countries and actually the numbers the, the numbers or the data that I was presenting was worse than those people develop, uh, presenting from developed countries. So we're talking about places like rural India, um, Nepal, uh, rural Indonesia. We've got actually worse hearing health, worse hearing health in the Northern Territory. So part of the pathophysiological basis for this is by the age of two months, 60% of indigenous babies are colonized with the main three pathogens that cause otitis media. And by 18 months, 40% of children have had a tympanic membrane perforation. Now, I um, worked for two years at the Children's Hospital in Sydney and not w doing ENT, and not once did I see a tympanic membrane perforation in a child under the age of two. It just doesn't happen. So, you know, that's what we're dealing with. 
Um, and more recent data has shown that 13% of children um, in the Northern Territory, are di Indigenous children in the Northern Territory, are diagnosed with CSOM, which basically is chronic suppurative otitis media. So that's patients that have had acute ear infections, they've perforated their eardrum, and now the eardrum just leaks pus and fluid, and they just don't heal because they've got constantly got something leaking out of the hole. The World Health Organisation defines a prevalence of this of 4% as a massive public health problem needing urgent action by the country. And our children, our Indigenous children in the top end, have a rate three times this. So what other reasons, obviously what we mentioned on the previous slide, but also the geographical location, and that's what we hear about today, is the rural and remote communities, so we're all aware of that. Um, but uh, this, these people are still living in low socioeconomic um, status and in, in impoverished conditions. One in two of them will live in crowded housing, and m so many of them don't have functioning um, adequate sewerage or functioning running water. So, you know, trying to keep their ears clean and, and keep, you know, snotty noses and all that kind of stuff clean on the children is just impossible for these, these communities. One of the big problems, and this is globally across health for Indigenous children, is poor nutrition and health literacy. So these communities are, are very, very isolated in the wet season. As we've mentioned, they're often, their only access is by plane. So getting fresh fruit and vegetables into these communities is nearly impossible. So their diet consists of mainly um, non-perishable items. So in reality, that usually means junk food. Um, even when we fly into the communities, we can't get food. We have to bring all our own food because you just you wouldn't eat otherwise. And also the limited access to primary health care um, and a difficulty in recruiting and retaining specialist work workforce in these areas. So what are the impacts? Um, so obviously social impacts. So if a child cannot hear, how are they going to do at school? They're going to be isolated, they're going to have lack, lack self-esteem, they're not going to interact with their peers, they're going to have cognitive impairment, they're going to have language impairment. And this, we know this leads to them dropping out of school at an earlier age and that obviously affects their job outcomes in the future and what their socioeconomic status is going to be in the future. So it's critical in terms of education of these children to make sure that they can hear when they're at school. And we did a, the, our department did a small study into the, um, the prison system in Darwin and they did a screen of the hearing health of Darwin inmates. 90% of Darwin inmates had hearing loss. So there must be some kind of causal relationship there. And obviously the huge um, cost and burden of ear disease on the system. So teleotology for us. So what was the rationale? We already had outreach services, which where we sent a, a group of clinicians, a group of CNCs and audiologists to these communities. But what we've got in Darwin and the Northern Territory is a, a big su supply demand imbalance. So we only have four ENT consultants, but we have a huge prevalence and a large population to service. So we came up with teleotology. Um, and I believe Western Australia is now running a similar program where it's a store and forward telemedicine service device, uh, service. So we've out, basically we've got ENT clinical nurse consultants and audiologists that go out to the communities and clinics, collect the data for us, and then they come back to Darwin and our, my bosses will have a look at that data and then make a diagnosis and management plan. So basically the, the ENT CNCs will go for a week into these communities um, and they'll do a full ear and hearing health history. They'll do the um, clinical assessment with a, a digital otoscope. So they can look at the eardrum, take a picture of that, and then that's what's forward on to the, um, the specialist in Darwin, as well as a copy of the audiogram and a copy of the history. They can treat minor things as well, so if the child needs eardrops, they'll give eardrops. If they've got a foreign body that needs removing, they can do a lot of education as well with the families and, and, and the clinics. So the other aspect to it is obviously huge, is education. So when we do that, go on the outreach, we're really only there for a day, and our aim is just to see as many patients as possible in the quickest amount of time. We don't often have a lot of time to go into education with these patients, so that's a real benefit of sending in a team that stays in for a week. They have the time to sit with the families. And, 
And the other big thing is if when we talk about surgery, a lot of these patients, English is not their first language. Children, a lot of the children don't even speak English, so they can't communicate or talk to you. So we have to get the elders in um, of the family and to to even consent for surgery, there has to be a big group discussion. So if the nurses can identify, it's clear as day this child's got an, a perforated eardrum, needs an operation for a graft, they can then spend the rest of that week going through talking to everyone who's relevant to that patient to um, get consent for the procedure. And then when they do come to Darwin for the procedure, we're able to easily consent them in a um, documented form. So. They, uh, the nurses head to 45 remote communities. Populations of sizes are variable. We go to the homelands, which just the big family groups tend to be, and to our biggest size, which is about 2,000 people in a community. And as I mentioned, English is often a second language. And our visits can be great or they can be not so good. And that's, we try and work around sort of community and cultural obligations that we're aware of but you know things like sorry business or sporting events happen and we we don't really we can't anticipate that so often we get no, a lot of no-shows during those clinics but we wear that because we know that at other clinics will pick up a lot other more patients so we operate out of the primary health care clinic um, and we also go to schools and correctional service facilities the audiologists are very that come with us are fantastic because they have to really adapt to what facilities are there. So we all get the nice cushy clinic rooms, but they'll sometimes even they get sometimes get a sound treated booth, but often they'll just work out of a shipping container. Which you imagine doing an audiogram in a tinny shipping container it can be quite challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So the benefits, we've talked about the benefits, like we all know what the benefits of actually bringing the service to the, the population rather than bringing these patients to us. Um, we found that we've had much better community penetration with actually taking people into the community for a long period of time compared to just flying in and out, you know, spending a day there. Um, and the other benefit is that the primary healthcare clinics, ENT is a bit, little bit invisible in these situations because we're dealing with a community that's got significant high rates of renal disease, rheumatic heart and cardiac problems and diabetes. So ENT, it's not really something that you see a lot of, like you can't physically, unless the kid's got pus pouring out the ear, you don't really know. It's, so it's not, the awareness of ENT is not high on the agenda for these people. So to let the clinics know that we are there and we're committed and we're coming back regularly um, makes them more aware to filter patients through to us and, and chase up those kids that we can't track down, um, you know, because they, their families are nomadic still, so they move from community to community. And of course, it reduces the burden on our um, uh, department in Darwin. So this is all very well. So the idea of it was fantastic, but we had to prove that it was actually reproducible and works. So what we did in, in the early stages is we did a, a small study to look at um, 55 patients, so that's 110 ears, and whether what we were seeing on teleotology matched to what we would see if the ENT consultant reviewed the patient in person. So we did this and we found that there was actually only eight out of 110 ears had a difference. So the ENT surgeon saw the teleotology consultation forms and then reviewed the patient and only changed his or her um, opinion in eight cases. So it's a diagnostic rate of 93%. So of course financial benefits and this is one that's really important because for working in the outpatient department in Darwin when you get a patient coming from community and a lot of our patients are still from community, that patient just for a five minute visit which you often feel bad about because you're rushed and you're under pressure and you have to you know, get through a big clinic, they've come with a escort, sometimes two escorts. They the flights aren't, you know, they can't fly there that morning and fly back, so they're often down for a week in Darwin, taking them away from, you know, the rest of the family, the rest of the community, their, ch their other children. Um, and Darwin's a big place for these people. A lot of the patients we've seen have never left their community, so it's quite a daunting experience. And then we talk to them about, you know, doing horrific surgeries on them, so they get, you know, very put off. So. Financially, it is, it is much more viable to take a team to the community rather than bring every single patient um, to our department. And it, again, reduces burden on us. So uh, 
I'm, I apologise, I haven't got that 18, 2018 data ready yet, but for 2017, we had four ENT CNCs that were participating in this. We saw 725 clients over 34 different communities. But you can see we've got a huge way to go. We still have 2,700 outstanding referrals um, that need to be triaged and seen. From that year, we had, of our, all of our patients, 60% had otitis media, 55% had hearing loss, thank you, and 17% had a perforated eardrum with discharge. 34% received medication and just needed follow-up in the primary healthcare clinic, so we avoided having to get any other service involved. They could be just um, sorted out on a local basis. 13% had ongoing recommendations for surgery, and then 64% we had to follow them up, so either by the teleotology service or by getting them actually physically to our outpatients or getting them into a clinic where we come to a, a community, a larger community that's close by um, again later on in the year. And we do on refer to Australian Hearing a lot for hearing aid services, um, allied health and get involved with the schools if we if we need the children to be wearing hearing hats and etc. So they were sitting up the front of the class. So that's all very good and I mean we can manage the ear disease and we can do all the medical things but a huge part of this is sort of um, trying to anticipate and, and reduce the numbers. So health literacy is really, really important. Um, and the nurses, to be honest, are probably much better at this than we are um, because they, they get in there and they get um, with the families, they go to the schools, they do visits at the schools and they're often just impromptu. Like they'll say, oh, okay, no one's showing up for the afternoon session. We'll, we'll pop off to the school and see who we can round up and talk to the kids. And so um, it's a much more informal basis. and. Um, they, we also even go around to houses and just round up patients as well. So we'll often take the, we'll often take the four-wheel drive out and just go and see who we can find. Um, challenges, we've gone through all this before. Um, and, but it also is that the patients, I think I touched on it before, but a lot of these patients, they're, they come from families and, and community groups that are nomadic, so they travel from community to community. So that can be quite a difficult task for us, is to actually find where this child's gone to. Um, and also actually getting their carer or their guardian with the, in with them, because they'll often be looked after by auntie, but who, who is auntie? It's sometimes a bit very hard for us to establish what the actual family relationships are. So the good bits, obviously, I've had a fantastic time. I've been up and down for six months, and I'm going back for another six months um, because it's just it's been a real cultural eye opener for me, and um, I've really, really enjoyed it. And you know, I've learnt skills there that I can't use in, say, Sydney or Melbourne or Tassie, but um, it's skills that no doubt that are valuable to my future practice. So, and also working towards a common goal. Um, well, I think we've touched on all of this as well throughout the talk. Um, and any questions? Thank you very much.